Hello and welcome to another episode of Shattered Lives, Reach Ireland's crime podcast for the Mirror and Star newspapers. I'm crime and defence editor Michael O'Toole, joined as ever by our crime correspondent Paul Healy. Hello, Paul. Hello, Michael O'Toole. <laughs> another busy week. We, we we rarely get days, weeks or even days where we can take the piss. <laughs> rarely. Sometimes we get away with taking the piss now, I won't lie. <laughs> but uh, the joys of the job. Yeah. Yeah, so this has been a very busy week. It has. Um, we we want to kick off talking about uh, something. Uh, sorry, that's actually literally just mm. broke uh, uh, as we're um, recording this podcast, and it's in relation to the son of Thomas Bomber Kavanagh, uh, Jack Kavanagh. So, um, listeners may recall that Jack Kavanagh had been accused of a, a role in this firearms conspiracy that Thomas Bomber Kavanagh and Liam Byrne have both pleaded guilty to. And he was sought in relation to that. Uh, but there has been a long um, series of extradition hearings to get him back to the UK. Today, he has been extradited back to the UK to face trial on firearms charges. Yeah, so I think that the, the actual extradition has been on the, the pitch, shall we say, since last year. I think he was arrested. He was. I, I thought it was interesting. He was trying to go from, was it Dubai? He was arrested in Turkey after, or, or he was arrested in Spain. He was trying to go to Turkey via, to, to be Turkey via Spain, basically, which is a bit, it sounds a bit of a strange route. But yes. yet again, if we think about Liam Byrne, Liam Byrne was arrested in Spain. So what that shows is once there's a European arrest warrant, or there's a cooperation treaty because Britain is not part of the EAW anymore, you land anywhere in the European Union and you're banjaxed if they find out you're there. Mm hmm. I, I want to read out what the National Crime Agency are saying about Jack Kavanagh. They're saying the son of Thomas Bomber Kavanagh, one of the most trusted Kinahan OCG associates. So now the National Crime Agency are saying uh, openly that Thomas Kavanagh is a trusted Kinahan cartel associate. Of course, they can say that now because he has pleaded guilty. Um, now, Jack Kavanagh still has to face trial. He is accused of being involved in the supply and acquisition of firework, uh, firearms after um, the, these encrypted messages were hacked into and discovered. So he's alleged to be part of these encrypted conversations and involved in the uh, in the overall supply and acquisition of these firearms that they found. Our listeners may recall that we were talking about this bizarre plot in which uh, firearms were recovered in a field in the north of Ireland by the PSNI. And this was on the basis of a tip off from Thomas Bomber Kavanagh himself to the National Crime Agency, of course, uh, trying to get himself a reduced sentence. Uh, it didn't work in his favour because uh, the whole the whole thing blew up in his face when these encrypted chats were uncovered in 2020, uh, 2021. So, so we'll, we'll be watching that with interest. He's facing trial next month. And isn't it this month that Bomber Kavanagh and Liam Byrne are sentenced? Yeah, on the 21st, I'm going to say, and the 22nd of this month, uh, we're expecting uh, Liam Byrne and Bomber Kavanagh to be sentenced in this case. As I said, with Liam Byrne, I think he can face up to 10 years and with Bomber Kavanagh, up to life in prison. Yeah, and so whatever happens... I think it's safe to say we know that Bomber Kavanagh is in in prison for the um, um, drugs importation on behalf of the Kinning cartel from a few years ago. But I think it's safe to say both men are facing a significant jail time here. Significant jail time, as I said, up to 10 years for Liam Byrne uh, and up to life for Bomber Kavanagh. And, he's, and Bomber Kavanagh is already serving a 21 year sentence. They're both in Belmarsh Prison, a maximum security uh, cap, uh, category A prison in London. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but Jack Kavanagh, you know, this is the latest person to be charged and now going to be brought before the courts in this conspiracy. There are others that they are also seeking that we we can't talk about. And there was an interesting, if I, if I read that the NCA press release properly, it basically said, we're going to hunt, hunt down everybody. Anybody that, that we believe is involved in serious criminality, like the Kenyan cartel, we're going after you. And it's really sending out a message, isn't it? And it's interesting, I think, because for several years, maybe 2010, all the way up to even 2017, 2018, I think law enforcement was in the back foot. And I, now it appears that they've, I'm not saying they've won, but it would appear that the tide has turned and they are getting to grips with gangland in Ireland and Britain. 
Big time. And you, you see that kind of cooperation between the NCA in particular and Gardaí. It has yielded massive results. And even in the case of Bomber Kavanagh, it isn't over for him yet. There is now a proceeds of crime case uh, going on in the UK against Bomber Kavanagh. So he has a mansion out in Tamworth. It really is a spectacle of a house. It's a beautiful house. Um, I was out at it before myself. Um, and they are now attempting to uh, seize that uh, as a, as a they have, they're deemed it to be a proceeds of crime that has come about because of the cooperation with Gardaí and the sharing of intelligence that ultimately led to Bomber Kavanagh's house being raided all the way back in 2019 that infamous stun gun find which was enough to put him away while they were still investigating him for the importation of the drugs I think it's it's almost impossible to underestimate the importance of cooperation. So you have the cooperation between the guard, the, the guardian, the PSNI work very very closely together, and the NCA are involved with the PSNI and that sort of stuff. But there's other levels of cooperation. We know about Europol, we know about Interpol, but even things like say the Guardi have increased their liaison bureau around the, the world. So we know that there's a a liaison inspector in Colombia. We know that there are two officers in uh, Dubai. But I just wonder how many of these big, say, for example, all these big drugs captures that we've had in Ireland the last couple of years, significant amount of major drug seizures. I wonder how many of them are as a result of this increased worldwide cooperation. Yeah, I mean, we would have. <laughs> we'll never know because it's an either it's the netherworld. Yeah. But, you know, there has been a significant increase. And I remember being at a a meeting, I think it was the, the Oireachtas Committee, the, the Commissioner Drew Harris was talking about this and he was talking about, we want to, I think maybe the police and authority, he wants to increase the footprint of Angarda Síochána around the world. And to me, my view would be that is, it has increased significantly and to me there are, are significant uh, results as a result of that uh, cooperation. Mm-hmm. And and if if only for that, we wouldn't have results like the ones we're talking about today. I mean, and Gardy would openly admit that that they, they, they their ability to go after these criminals, you know, they it, it is limited. And obviously, a lot of these criminal gangs now operate internationally. And um, so it's thanks to that kind of cooperation that we're seeing uh, the likes of Bomber Kavanaugh and Liam Byrne being prosecuted. Um, Remains to be seen as to whether that can result in the prosecution of the Kinahans, but we might come back to that. But I mean, there is a lot of, I suppose, open speculation really as to why I uh, noticed Sunday Times piece by John Mooney. Um, we're going to talk about another piece by John Mooney later, but um, it was interesting. I read it and just the, the, you know, I suppose it's more than speculation. There is a genuine suspicion that the Kinahans have over the years. Uh, been largely untouched because of their possible associations with law enforcement and that they may have in their own right been touting uh, to basically save their own skin. Um, That's entirely possible. It might explain why uh, they've been able to go on as they have, but we don't know. We're not privy to that. And we will never know. And there's this, the guards do call them tights, but their technical title is Chiz. Right. Mm-hmm. Covert human information source, I believe. So maybe they have been chased up. We, 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 I can guarantee you we will never know because those things, I'm not even talking about them if they are. I don't know. I, I read John's piece, I was more concerned with his other piece we're going to talk about. So I really scanned it because it was sort of, oh, no, Jesus, about the other story. But look, we, lots of criminals do tight. Mm-hmm. And they do it to save themselves and they do it to shaft somebody else. And it's all about self-protection. So, look, I'm, I'm not going to talk about, like, I don't know if the Kenhins are, but I will say it would be of no surprise to me that any criminal was tied into the Guardi or the English cops or whoever, because it happens all the time. Yeah, save their own skin. Shall we talk so, about... Yeah, so just to recap, the 21st of, of October, you'll hear about the prison sentences, if there are sentences, as there probably will be for... Avia yep. and Liam Byrne. So that's one prison story. We have you have another prison story, quite a, a very sad prison story about a, a murder or a homicide in an Irish prison over the weekend. Yeah, well, this doesn't happen too often. I mean, uh, people do die in tragic circumstances in prison all the time. We've talked about it over the last while on this podcast, a number of overdoses. But uh, this is a murder. And uh, it's quite serious uh, and quite brutal. Um, and at first broke on Saturday morning um, when prison officers, when it emerged that prison officers had gone into this cell on the D1 landing of Cloverhill Prison in West Dublin and discovered this prisoner dead inside. His name is Martin Salinger 
uh, and he was in there on remand. He was facing uh, a trial in relation to a significant seizure uh, of drugs and also uh, with possession of a firearm after he was stopped by Gardy in, in a vehicle. So he's from the Ballyfermid area. Um, um, but yeah, look, he, he was discovered dead in the cell. The officers, I understand, were responding to uh, some sort of a disruption when they got in. Uh, two prisoners came out and one remained, as I said, and that was Mr. Salinger. Now, you know, when you hear about these things, Mick, we hear details. We don't hear everything. It, it, we, what we know now and what we knew on Saturday, you know, we, we've learned a lot. Um, but, you know, we, what I'm being told now is that this was a particularly bloody and gruesome scene. So we're not talking about... Um, you know, a, a, an argument gone wrong here and, and somebody was killed in some sort of a mistake or whatever. I was told there was blood up the walls and I mean, you know, high up the walls. So this guy was very seriously assaulted. Um, so it is a murder. It's being investigated by Guardian Ronan's town and uh, the cell was preserved as a crime scene. It's almost kind of the perfect crime scene for Guardian because it can kind of just keep it all as is. And there's going to, you know, I mean, it, it, they can also keep the suspect where he is because uh, the suspect is also a prisoner himself. So the suspicion is um, that there was some sort of row between Salinger and a cellmate of his uh, who was a particularly violent uh, a, a inmate who's been in and out of prison for a number of very serious offences, uh, aggravated assault, you know, very, very bad assault um, offences he's been in for before. Just to explain to people, and I'm sure a lot of people do know, Clover Hill Prison is a remand prison. So, uh, you know, all of these prisoners would be in facing charges before the court, and that's why they're in Clover Hill Prison. And Mr. Salinger, as I said, was facing charges, and this suspect was facing charges. Um, so it's suspected that this guy attacked him. Um, they basically immediately isolated him and put him in what's called a close observation unit. And then Gardy actually went into the prison uh, the following day uh, and executed a warrant, Section 42 warrant, to take him out of Clover Hill Prison and interview him, uh, arrest him uh, on suspicion of murder. They did that. They questioned him uh, and they ultimately released him without charge. Uh, and a file is being prepared for the DPP. But when I say released him, he isn't going anywhere. He's gone straight back to prison and he went back to that observation cell. Now, last night, they moved him. Uh, so he has been moved to the Midlands prison. Uh, and again, he's isolated from any of the prison population there. So tell me this, there, there, there were, I think there, there is, we all know there's an issue of overcrowding in Irish prisons. And in this case, there were three inmates in that cell. There probably should have been two. What happened to the third inmate? Well, the third inmate has been moved as well, but that third inmate was badly assaulted himself. Uh, he was attacked, they think, by the, the same dangerous uh, criminal. And uh, the way that it has been explained to me is that this person was either asleep or unaware of what was going on, sleeping on the top bunk of their bed, and that they were told by this other cellmate to come down and make them a cup of tea. When they did so, they were assaulted. Um, now, we our initial information was because this is a highly unusual aspect mm -hmm. of it. So you and we only hear just to explain to people, we don't hear the full picture. We don't get the full picture. We get breadcrumbs. And what we were told, both of us, is uh, that there was some kind of a shiv like weapon used in this attack. And then when we did a bit of digging, we discovered that that was apparently a broken piece of a kettle. So what I'm being told now uh, is that this broken kettle piece was used to attack the other cellmate who had serious kind of slash wounds, but non-life threatening. Um, however, they do not think at this juncture, that doesn't mean they won't find a, a shiv, but they do not think that that was used to kill Martin Salinger. So well, it, they don't actually have the suspected weapon in that attack if there even was one, because I'm now being told they think he might have been beaten to death. But but that would be an indication because you're right. I was told stabbed, and I think most people were sort of briefed. So was I. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's an indication of the violence. In other words, yes. if someone, if there is that level of blood, about you're talking about the blood, blood being on high up in the walls, 
and there are indications that you that you can't look as if you've been stabbed because of the level of violence. So but yes. there has to be a significant level of violence for that to take place. Well, I I I, I don't want to get too gruesome for people here, but Mr. Sanader did have a puncture wound to his neck. And so, you know, we, that's why we said he was stabbed in the neck. He did, he does have a wound to the neck, but um, the circumstances of how that would have come about are, are, are starting to emerge that that may be a, a, an injury on his own body caused by a very violent assault. Um, so in other words, that puncture was, was caused by, uh, by, it wasn't caused by any weapon. It was caused in the in the uh, in the assault itself. So, um, it, look. It, it, nonetheless, whatever way it happened, it was a particularly gruesome and violent attack. It is a murder, and it is being investigated as such. Um, Cardi have only one suspect. There's no one else uh, that they suspect in this case. And I think the only reason why no one is charged at this point. Uh, is because their suspect is not going anywhere. So they have time to gather all the evidence that they can. Yes, and you can't keep arresting someone. You can only, as you know, for example, if you arrest someone on a Monday because you think it was him and then he doesn't make any admissions, you can't release them and then go, right, tomorrow we'll bring him in again. You have to re-arrest only for the purpose of charge or if there's new evidence to put to this person. And you're right, Paul, you know, and there will obviously, I would anticipate because of the nature of the wounds about, do we know whether he was stabbed or not? There might have to be tests, you know, further blood tests and that sort of thing. And, and you know, if, especially if you don't make admissions, files tend to go to the DPP for that. If he had said, look, I did it and I'm sorry, blah, 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 he probably would have been charged there and then. But look, he is in prison. Yeah. They are waiting for their tests. And it's very much a case of measure twice, cut once. In other words, the guards don't want to mess this up by being hasty. Exactly. And and as far as I know, I don't think they uncovered any uh, particular motive at this point, uh, other than the person that attacked him is, is a very violent and aggressive individual. And <laughs> um, to explain also for context, they were in uh, a particular part of the cell, the D1 uh, part of, of, of Clover Hill, sorry, uh, which was which meant that they were separated from the rest of the general prison population because uh, they were deemed to be particularly dangerous criminals uh, and they were uh, they were an issue for the prison service. So they had been moved onto that landing uh, and and while they were together, they were separated from the rest of the prison population. So yes, overcrowding is an issue, but also there were concerns about Salinger and the two individuals who were in the cell with them. They were both, uh, all, sorry, all three of them were of a concern enough to be moved up onto that D1 landing and they would have spent an awful lot of time cooped up together. Um, I think the prison service would probably say that that wasn't an ideal situation, but that is the reality of the overcrowding situation that they have. And they can't have particularly dangerous and difficult prisoners mixing with the prison population either. The other issue is, as I found out, uh, that Martin Salinger was actually assaulted two weeks prior uh, to his murder by three other prisoners uh, when he was in the general prison population. So he was would have also been moved for his own safety uh, away from those people who attacked him. That was a separate attack. I don't know if it has any connection whatsoever to what ultimately happened to him. Uh, it may not, but it shows you the reality of the, the violent reality of, of living in a prison like that. Um, I also just want to talk a little bit about Salinger because uh, mm. I, I obviously, look, he is a victim and uh, there were plenty of tributes to him uh, from family members. A son of his paid tribute on social media and friends. Uh, he was known to be involved in the horse and carriage business in Dublin and he, he had even been interviewed about it in the past Um and phot photographed on his horse and carriage and would have brought tourists and people around the city centre on that horse and carriage. But look, he also uh, was involved in criminality and there is a suspicion that he was that he was mixed up with um, more serious organised criminals, Kinahan cartel affiliated criminals. Um, and, you know, on the 15th of August, he was caught in a car um, by the Garda Armed Support Unit with 20 grand worth of cannabis and a handgun. So, I mean, you know, you're not any ordinary Joe Soap when you're caught with something like that. Say what you will about drugs. Everybody has their own views about drugs. But possessing a, a, a revolver is totally different game ball. Yeah. That's really, really heavy stuff. And the guards, yeah. the guards are always jubilant when they get a farm. They're mostly an unarmed force. 
but they are really jubilant and it's something really, really serious when they get a, a firearm, as they would call it. Yeah. Um, so that's 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 the state of where the investigation mm-hmm. is at the moment. Um, as I said, the suspect isn't going anywhere. There is a, another a twist in this, uh, in that uh, the suspect in this case, as I said, is a, a very violent offender and there are serious concerns about him and his lashing out. And in the course of looking at him, um, there has been a bit of a realization by investigators that, oh, this isn't the first time that he shared a cell with somebody who died. Now, this could turn out to be absolutely nothing, uh, mm. but investigators have to look at it out in a, over an abundance of caution. Um, there was a man who died in Cloverhill Prison in June of this year, uh, and he, he also was in a cell with the chief suspect now in the murder of Martin Salinger. At the time, it was believed and still is until proven otherwise believed that he died of natural causes. Um, but there is a concern that this guy, he was quite violent. Uh, you know, this is the second person who's died in a cell around him. So questions are being asked about that. Now, when I put the query formally to Gardaí, I was told that they await uh, the, a coroner's report as they do with all deaths. Um there is no criminal investigation into the death of that man in June at this juncture. Um, it's only if they suddenly uncover evidence to the contrary. But it did raise a, a red flag enough that the prison service, uh, the Irish prison service had alerted Gardaí about that fact and also the inspector of prisons, which investigates all deaths in custody about that as well. So I understand it's going to be re-examined just to make sure out in abundance of caution that there is no suspicion uh, or otherwise uh, on the on the death of that man. But it is just a curious development, really. I, I tend not to believe in coincidences myself. Mm-hmm. But maybe in this case, that's just what it was. Maybe maybe it was. But look, the, the, I, I, the man is a very dangerous man. I was talking with somebody who he offered out a really dangerous, notorious criminal. And that other fellow said no. So it shows you how dangerous this suspect is. He's a really, really dangerous man. So look, I'm sure you're right. It has to be looked at, Paul. They'd have to. Yeah. And I mean, there are, look, the reality of living in prison is tragedies do happen. People do die. We've talked about them a few times. And even on Monday, another man died in Clover Hill Prison uh, completely by, again, natural causes. But uh, people do die in prison. It does happen. Uh, and in that case, that man was... Uh, a, a, a foreign immigrant who was actually being deported. So uh, you can end up in Clover Hill prison if you're on remand for something. You can also end up in Clover Hill if you are facing deportation. That man was facing deportation and he just appar- apparently died in his cell uh, overnight. Um, so, you know, th- these tragic deaths do happen uh, and it may well turn out that that case in June is also just a, a, a tragic uh, death and a pure coincidence, but they are looking at it. So, okay, there's another prison story. Should we talk about my prison story? Slightly different. Yes, this is slightly different, but very interesting. And and hmm. it, I, it was, it, I, I I suppose, a revelation for me. I didn't realize that we were kind of alone in this, in having hmm. defense force members uh, around Port Leash Prison. But tell us about this. So, Port Leash Prison is what you call the Supermax, the Ireland, Ireland's only top security prison. So, it used back in the day, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, it was largely devoted to paramilitary prisoners. They used, to be, they used to be called subversives, believe it or not. IRA, INLA, mostly them. Okay, And so, so there were such concerns that in 1974, a platoon, everybody's heard about UN Post 652, it's a platoon of soldiers down there, 30 to 35 men and women. So, so since 1974, a platoon of uh, Irish soldiers have been on constant duty on the roof. I remember seeing them actually once on the roof of Port Asia Prison and there's sort of turret, like, you know, you know the structure down there, there's these big walls and you can, there's a sort of walkway and they do yeah. that. So, you know, they're not based, every unit isn't based there permanently. There's a rota of platoons that go down and do it. Was the most taxing of positions for the Defence Forces, nor was it the most popular, but there was a review and last Monday, Monday last Monday week, we heard about this. I was at the RACO conference, which is the representative association, representative association for commissioned officers, so army officers union, basically. And it emerged there from talking to various people that the platoon has now been taken away 
So there's now no longer an armed uh, soldier presence. Now, somebody was saying, I haven't had time to check this, but I believe it, that that was the only prison in Europe at the minute where there were armed soldiers. So I think they want the government, the, the, the threat level has significantly reduced. There's a few dissident paramilitaries down there, but an awful lot of the, the people in, or at least at the minute, would be what used to be called ODCs, ordinary decent criminals, non-paramilitary criminals. Say, for example, Aaron Brady, He's serving his 40-year sentence for the murder of Detective Guard to Adrian Donohue. He's in Port Alicia. Keelan Smith, one of the Kinnan heads. There's plenty of other uh, Kinnan prisoners down there. There's one significant fellow, I can't name him for legal reasons, but there are serious gangsters there. But there has been a review and essentially the government decided, after looking at all the stuff, that they did not need armed soldiers down there. And they have been there since 1974. So it was quite a historic time for it to go. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. As I just, I didn't realize we were kind of alone in that. I definitely would have, uh, you know, having been down at Port Leash Prison and covered things, it would have seen them uh, patrolling at times. Um, but it's interesting that they've made the decision now. I mean, I suppose yeah. it would. It was a, it was an important role, I think, by the defence forces, and um, especially at a time when a lot of people might be questioning what do our defence forces members do. It's a curious decision, but I suppose there's been a justification for it. I, I, it would be safe to say that the defence forces themselves are quite happy to leave that post. Oh, okay. It, it, was, it wasn't very yeah. popular, you know. It was just right, right. static guard duty, effectively, mm. and they thought, well, surely there can be better use of resources. Mm. So the defence forces are very stretched. They do a lot of things that are, you know, don't make the light of day, shall we say. So I think they were more than happy to, to get rid of that. But I just thought it was like the, the defence force have had the open fire down there. I think I remember that reading... They shot dead a man during the troubles. One of the there were several escape efforts, and one uh, Republican was shot dead. He wasn't a prisoner. I think it was around the place they were trying to get in, or the people were trying to get out. There were it was quite right. hot and heavy down there back in the day, and, and the defence forces were needed. But the, the IRAs, what they would call their war, is long, long gone, and there's no but a near replicating any of that. So I think the defence force would be very happy to do this, and it does show that society has been normalised now that civic society, as it were, doesn't need the military in this regard. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you have yeah. things like the armed support unit. You know, it's, it's poorly said there would be an armed support unit in that area and the armed support unit can gather very quickly from other places it's, around Leinster and stuff. Yeah, and it still very much remains, I suppose, the country's maximum security prison. Mm. It is still probably the most secure prison in the country, even without that. Oh, it is. And look, mm. you know, the guards are a couple of minutes away the armed guardie would be a couple of minutes away and, you know, the, there w- there wasn't really an armed support unit, you know, maybe for the last 10 or 15 years, but before that there wasn't. So it was dependent on the army. So I, most people would regard this as normalisation, which is always a good thing. Okay. Shall we talk about cobalt? We shall. <laughs> Well, now this this is a fascinating story, and it has made headlines all week. Um, mm-hmm. This is the kind of story that uh, every journalist wants to get one that is agenda setting, so to speak. And kudos to the uh, the great John Mooney of the Sunday Times, who's clearly been investigating this for some time. Uh, and that is the existence of an apparent Russian asset in the Oireachtas. Um, someone who is acting in the interests of Russia and has been compromised by uh, the Russian government in some capacity. Um, to date, the date of this podcast, that Oireachtas member remains unidentified, but certainly plenty of people have been trying to find out who it is. And you did a bit of digging on this during the week. I think you have a fair idea who we're talking about for reasons uh, we still can't name him, uh, but we can certainly yes. give you, we can certainly give you a lot more detail as to uh, exactly what Gardy think he's been up to the last while. Mooney's story is, is accurate. I, I Not that I would need to check it, but I have to, we have to check our, our own stuff. So I was checking with various people. And look, I, I know at the start you said it's a sort of story every journalist would love to get. It is a sort of story every journalist would lo- love to get. However, it's also a pain in the arse because <laughs> by its very nature, you open yourself up to ridicule. So mm-hmm. the way I say to people is, if you got this story, you'd be cursing yourself for getting it, but you know you would know you'd have to run it because if you believe it to be true, you have to run it. And it's as simple as that. No matter 
Mooney got absolutely hockeyed on social media. What's new? But, you know, there was a level of anger about this story. Quite, I was quite surprised by it. It's, I mean, look, a story is a story. I believe the story to be true. I did my own digging. But essentially, this person was repeatedly uh, approached by state security apparatus here, Guardian Military Intelligence, to warn him, say, listen, the Russians are after you. You've got various taps in the shoulder. The Russians are after you. You need to be very careful about this. Now, personally, if somebody came up to me and said, look, Mick, if some spy or, or crime and security or J2 military intelligence come up to me and said, look, Mick, the Russians are after you. I would become a tad nervous. But the way it was <laughs> described to me is this person laughed, repeatedly laughed it off. Now, having said that, I think John said this. There's no suggestion he's done anything illegal because he's not, I need to be careful, he's not at the centre of power. That's yep. a fair enough point, right? Mm -hmm. So, he, I mean, I've been joking about this. He doesn't have access to the nuclear codes. <sighs> okay. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that he can't be, and you know, John's story talks him about him being an agent of influence. And that's what the suspicion is, that the belief is that this man has been approached to do. You can do plenty of things to disrupt. You can act bollocks, really. And the other point to make is, I know the Taoiseach said it should come as no surprise. I wouldn't be surprised if the Taoiseach was briefed about this. I'd be surprised if he wasn't. I'll put it that way. Mm. But he, this person is not unique. Russia and China. And by the way, there was also stories, and this is no surprise to me, that Britain have a very significant spy in the corridors of power in Ireland, right? Why would anybody think Ireland is immune from this? It, this goes to my central point. Irish people as a whole, because of where we're based and because of the benign security situ situation we have in Ireland and all those sort of things. Who's invaded? Last time people didn't invade us were our British friends 800 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So who's going to invade it? You know, all that sort of stuff. So people have a very relaxed attitude in my mind to all aspects of state security. We don't have any... Uh, planes to defend our skies, to police, all that sort of stuff. So the reaction to this really has been another exemplar of that to me, that people aren't that vexed or worried or even slightly concerned about all aspects of state security or state defence. Ireland is a very important strategic area. China wants to know what's happening here. Russia wants to know what is happening here. And Britain and America wants to know what is happening here. They all have agents here. We have to be realistic. And they all try and recruit people. Now, I would argue that, you know, say during the Troubles, maybe there would have been some members of the state security apparatus who have a particular hatred to the IRA and decided, you know what, I'm going to tell my mate in MI5 exactly what we know about the North Lowe, the unit of the IRA. Do you know what I mean? Does that make them a spy? Well, it's someone who is providing intelligence to an agency outside of Ireland so it's 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 rife. I mean, it really is rife. Ireland is, is somewhere that is very active for intelligence agents. And, and and I mean, this is a bit more sinister than just somebody tapping them on the shoulder and and saying, "Hey, w w would you mind?" You know, no, uh, no, no. I'm saying that he was warned by several taps. No, no. I think they 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 mm. compromised this person. Well, uh, they they say the Russians used some form of a uh, it's called a honeypot. Uh, well, to basically lure this guy in, that he was in, that basically a female had been used to to try and woo this guy, and that they tried to play to his ego and all of that. Uh, I'm awesome with praise, I suppose, in order to basically use him as they saw fit. Which is, I mean, it's it's like something out of a spy novel, isn't it? It doesn't sound real. Yes, but I think most men would be prey. If there's some, you know, if you're some, nice. some very yeah. attractive young one, yeah, or you know, young one, suddenly, suddenly having an interest in you, <laughs> exactly, moon yeah. So look, it's it works. It's worked everywhere else. I, I will quibble. I know John called it a honey pot. I think it's more a honey trap than a honey pot. Mm. That's that's the thing I'm not going to quibble about. So anyway, I think it's a very significant story, and I know that everybody else has picked up on it. And they're the as I said, they're the sort of stories that you know you do. Call, do you remember that story I did about? the threat against Leo Varadkar. Yes. I was in sort of similar areas about that because it's intelligence. And that was an intelligence story. And my story was an intelligence story. And people were going, oh, there's no foundation for this. Look, 
it's the murky world of intelligence, right? And we and you spoke about journalists getting breadcrumbs. We don't get brought into uh, crime and security or the National Criminal Security Intelligence Service, whatever it's called now, and we don't get the files. So here you go back, have a read of that, put that in the front page of the Star in the Mirror tomorrow, or mm-hmm. with any murder case. So we get breadcrumbs. And I think, you know, I felt for John because it was a great story, but you open He's yourself up for, of uh, course, yeah. because... It's a it's a story about intelligence, and intelligence by its very nature is in the shadows. Is secretive, yeah. But in in a sense, and I mean, it, it proves the um, the importance of journalism and putting day the 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 strength that putting daylight on something has. I mean, okay, this has all happened under the radar, but by exposing it, by publicising it, I mean, look at the headlines over the last week, and the government have had to respond to it. The Taoiseach mm-hmm. has had to comment on it. Um, and it has sparked outrage and it remains to be seen what will happen. But I, I, I think maybe by shining a light on it, this person may be completely now compromised as a potential uh, resource for the Russians going forward. Maybe they'll continue to use them, but I don't know, with a bit of publicity around it, uh, in a way, this might be the most beneficial thing that happens in terms of completely uh, compromising that Russian asset. I have a question for you, Mr. Healy. <laughs> I love your questions. You catch me out with them. Go on. Would you like this <laughs> person to be named? Absolutely. I, I think mm. why not? Uh, you know, I, I think our laws in this country, uh, defamation laws, are, are above and beyond what they need to be. And it restricts journalism and it restricts us from going after um, really what is in the public interest. This person is a public representative. Uh, You know, we're all taxpayers. We deserve to know what people's interests are and what they're involved in. Um, And certainly, I think if, if, if not our organization, some news organization out there should be asking those questions and ultimately naming him, I would hope... Right. So I was going to say there's two chances of that happening and Slim just left town, but there are two chances of this happening. Mm. First one is if this man decides to come out and say, look, I've seen the stories. I want to say I am that person, but it's not me. Mm. I would I, I would I, be pretty confident that mm. he denies adamantly that it's him. Right. Okay. He is, I'd be pretty happy he's proclaiming his, in, his, his innocence. OK, yeah. now the only other way it can happen is if he is named under doll privilege. I was actually I was surprised. I, I thought so, sort of today's Wednesday. I thought somebody was going to do it on Tuesday. Some mm. some TD would go, right, it's X, whoever it is. Could happen right? by tomorrow. Yeah, it, it could happen at any time. And I was just maybe the cynic in me. I thought, OK, maybe somebody might want just to throw the cat amongst the patients or even get it out there. And they can, they can name someone under doll privilege. Now they'd be frowned upon, but doll privilege is doll privilege. I wouldn't be against approaching them and saying, "Understand, you're the person. See what he has to say." <laughs> yes, well, yeah, that has been tried. I put it that way. Okay, well, you know, I mean, I look. I think it's in the public interest that we know I, who I, he is. That's I, I, just I, I, a Russian agent of influence of Ireland, an agent of influence in the Oireachtas. There's a mm-hmm. massive uh, public interest in that. Of course there is. Mm. But our defamation laws ban Jaxes. Mm. I mean, we all know about Donald Trump, supposedly the greatest asset to Russia there's ever been. <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> but this goes to my point, right? We know that there have been people, where was it? Was it Germany? Uh, people run masks as Russian spies and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Why are people surprised? See, this is my point. Why are people surprised that this might be happening in Ireland? Everybody thinks we have this invisible glass wall around Ireland where we are safe from everything and we're a great wee country, but Jesus, mm-hmm. they're, they're, spies are, are interested in Ireland. Absolutely. And then I mean, we're next door to the UK as well. So, I mean, of course, they're interested in that and we're kind of a backdoor to the UK and they're interested in in, in them too. So, And I look, I'm going to rant, right? Some people hockeyed Mooney for this story. They didn't hockey the Irish news when they did a story about a British spy. You know, and, mm-hmm. and why? Because just, people just can't, they think they take things very personally. There was an attack, just non Parliamentarian, they've got completely outraged about this story, yet they were all going, well, that Irish news story about the spy, the MI5 spy is really, really interesting. I don't get it. News is news. That's where it should be. I agree. Will we move on to Bonnie and Murphy briefly? You mean stop ranting. 
A little bit. <laughs> uh, I have to keep you in check, Mick. You do. You, do. It's, it's, you know, you, you get to a certain age and and mm. the freedom to rant. I'm like those two geezers in the Muppets. Well, I'm a Muppet. You know, the, was it Walder and, Walder and Stadler or whatever they're called? Up in the... Shouted people. I hear you. We're going to talk about uh, briefly because we said we'd talk about it last week. Uh, Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy oh, yeah. uh, and the fact that they are appealing their conviction. Um, so Jason Bonney and Paul Murphy are currently serving uh, hefty sentences, eight and nine year sentences for facilitating the murder of David Byrne by acting as getaway drivers in the Regency shooting. And the evidence against them was coupled with CCTV and with corroborating other evidence. So uh, the three judge court of appeal uh, heard yesterday uh, their submissions as to why they believe their convictions are not safe. They said that the Special Criminal Court engaged in overreach and made sweeping conclusions, uh, such as that uh, one of the hitmen was in uh, the car of Paul Murphy. So Paul Murphy was driving a taxi and the CCTV evidence in that trial showed that he was driving a taxi right up to St. Vincent's GAA Club, where all of these cars picked up. Uh, the gang involved in the Regency shooting. Now his defence counsel is saying um, that that is a sweeping conclusion that just because he drove his taxi uh, that that he picked up one of the hitmen, that there was no evidence in the trial in relation to that. They were also convicted, if people might recall, on the basis of the existence of the Hutch criminal organisation of which they were considered to be members and Miss Justice Tara Burns, I recall, accepted the existence of that organisation after evidence was heard by senior Gardaí that they suspected uh, that it existed. But uh, counsel said that there was no real, uh, this is counsel for both men, said that there was no evidence that they were members of this organisation, that just because Paul Murphy knew uh, Atsy and Eddie Hutch through his work as a taxi driver, that doesn't ergo mean he is part of a criminal organization uh, he there was also argument about the cctv footage and that uh, and i i suspected as much that he he would make the same point that he made in his trial uh which is that the cctv footage doesn't definitively prove that it is his taxi that pulls in uh from buckingham village up to the saint vincent's gaa club that it's that it's not good enough and it can't be relied upon alone to prove that he picked up uh the hit team so that was the argument in relation to Paul Murphy. Now, counsel for Jason Bonney said there'd been overreach by the court in its findings. Um, and in his view, so people may recall that there was an interview with Jason Bonney where he was interviewed uh, without a caution. And uh, basically, Bonney is now submitting that that shouldn't have been admitted into evidence because uh, he, he was spoken to um and and that evidence was should should not have been in, used because of the lack of the caution. Um, yeah, there was also evidence about Buckingham Village, so that mm. is where the the hit team met up, and uh, that was where the there was the, the so called centre of operations for the murder. Um, and in, there was there was argument about the fact that um, Mr. Murphy regularly had access to Buckingham Village uh, that he had a key card found in his taxi. So those are the grounds, basically, uh, the CCTV footage and the fact that Bonnie uh, was interviewed in relation to the caution that that shouldn't have been admitted into evidence. And just as I was saying last week, and just to reiterate, uh, it's not about they don't like the verdict. They can't go, right, I want an appeal because I don't like the verdict. It has to be points of law. So really, mm. the, the argument would be that that, CCTV ev evidence shouldn't have been adduced. The stuff about the the phone card or the, the village booking village card that they, they're that really they're going on points of law really. And I would anticipate that like most appeals, if not all, there will be a reserved judgment on this. Yeah, there's a reserved judgment already. Uh, so there will be. Um, we we thought it might go over two days. It was it was scheduled for two days, but it is already dealt with, and the judges have reserved their judgment. So uh, they could come back in six months, or mm. even long, or, or shorter, or longer amount of time with a determination. Um, I do think it's interesting that there isn't really mention uh, about 
everything that Bonnie brought up in his actual trial uh, where he tried to say that his father drove Mm -hmm. the BMW X5 and not him. As you said, these things have to be argued on points of law and he's arguing primarily about the fact that he was interviewed without a caution and that that was induced as evidence. That's his grounds for his appeal. He hasn't gone into all of the claims that he wasn't the driver um, for whatever reason, they've obviously decided not to induce that uh, as as a grounds for appeal on this case. Anyway, they don't have that much. Lo- they don't have that long left in prison, relatively speaking. They didn't get what long did they get? Oh no, they got eight and nine. Oh, years. Was it eight? oh sorry, I thought there were it was three yeah. or four years, and that, that sort of oh so that is a good stretch. Oh, you can see yeah. why they're going for yeah. it then. Yeah. Okay, can we talk briefly and finally about? a case I've had an interest in for an awful lot of time, Madeleine McCann. There was a significant side development on this in the yeah, last Yeah, I mean, of days. Th- 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 this, is, this is very sad in one sense because, um, you know, and, and there was a twist in this case that no one really saw coming at the time, which was that this chief suspect in the murder of Madeleine McCann was just, ultimately turned out to be a suspect in the rape of an Irish woman um, by the name of Hazel Behan. Now, Hazel very bravely came forward, waived her anonymity and said that she had been uh, raped uh, in 2004 while on holiday. Um, And she believed that that person was Christian Bruckner when she saw his photograph plastered all over the media in relation to the Madeleine McCann case. She knew by the piercing blue eyes that that was her attacker. And the prosecutors in uh, in Germany uh, ultimately took note of that. And the case went forward and uh, Mr. Bruckner has been on trial for quite some time in relation to this and other offences. But uh, as of yesterday, he was cleared uh, of all of those uh, that the the judge ultimately found that there wasn't enough evidence Mm -hmm. um, that he was definitely the attacker. So the the attacker of Miss Behan had those piercing blue eyes, and that was something that she recognised in the in the face when she saw Christian Bruckner's face. But um, the the judge in this case had said there wasn't enough evidence um, to prove definitively that he was the attacker, and in fact the attacker had a mask, so that was you know uh, possible evidence that it could have been somebody else. But the judge did say. She had no doubt that uh, Miss Behan did suffer that attack, a horrendous rape uh, where she was uh, attacked three times, raped three times uh, by a by a man in, in black wearing a mask who came into her apartment uh, and held her hostage effectively and brutally raped her three times. Um, Miss Behan is convinced that that person was Christian Bruckner, but the court has has decided um, there just was simply wasn't enough evidence to prove that. So the question is now. Um, you know, what's what's left to keep Christian Bruckner in jail? He is a sex offender. He's serving time in prison, but he is due to be released in early 2025. And he remains a suspect in the Madeleine McCann case. But what's next? Yeah, and I, I was struck by two things. The judge reading a report of the judge's comments was she essentially said, I really think he did it, but there's just not enough evidence to convict him. And it was, it was they were quite strong comments by the judge and quite honest it was like uh, just, just it's just not enough and my other thought was having been deprived of Luge in September 2007 after Maddie disappeared in May 2007 and even when I went over six months or whatever later there was still a frenzy the British press were camped out there permanently and I just and it struck me being there I desperate the story was but I just wonder is this was that the last chance to find Maddie or to get to the bottom of what happened to Maddie because it's 17 years, more than 17 mm. years now. Yeah. And I was I was reading doing some research today, and you remember there were there were twins who were in the same room as Maddie. And whatever happened, Maddie disappeared, but the twins were left alone. And they're 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 adults now. It's mad, isn't it? And it's just it, it obsessed it obsessed the world. Do you remember the parents went to see the Pope and everything and it was a huge I, story. I, well, we, just, we might never know. And I just wonder about this Christian Bruckner fella. You know, I mean, at this point, how many years have the German uh, prosecutors been saying, a German police saying that they know that Madeleine is dead and that they believe that Christian Bruckner did it? Um, 
we've kind of learned tidbits of what their evidence is, but they we they supposedly have other evidence we don't know about mm. yet. It's not enough. It hasn't been enough to charge him with her murder to date. So what's going to happen when we get to next year and he's being released from prison? Um, the clock is really running out for them to kind of keep a hold of him. But, but even what the German police said was, for me, it was extraordinary to say, you know, to quite publicly and say, we think he did it. We, we know she's dead. We know she's dead. And we think he did it. Mm. You know, if Germans have this reputation as being quite conservative and, you know, quite re- reserved and things. They came out and said it was him, basically. They they basically did um, on the and and they have said confidently that Madeline is dead. Yeah. On the ba- on the basis of what evidence I don't know, but um, look, it, it's tragic, and I feel for Hazel Bean. I mean, obviously Hazel is an Irish uh, lady, and um, she had previously been interviewed on the Late Late Show. I think in relation to something else, she had connection to uh, Sinn Fein back in the years, uh, but uh, that that was kind of how pictures of her first sort of emerged. Um, but uh, she spoke quite bravely on ITV uh, yesterday, just speaking of her devastation, basically. Um, and and she remained convinced. She she I'm going to read out something she just said here. Uh, I'm shattered, really broken. She said my her attacker had piercing blue eyes. They're bore into my head. They're there. They're imprinted on who I am. They'll never leave. Spend hours in a room with somebody who is absolutely torturing you and all you can see is their eyes. By God, you better believe. I'll remember them. I made sure I'd remember them. I see them every time I close my eyes. So she obviously remains convinced that Christian Buckner is the man responsible. Um, it's very sad that the court didn't believe her, I suppose, or that, the, or that there there wasn't simply enough evidence um, to prove otherwise. Um, and so Christian Bruckner has walked from that case. It's extraordinary. There, there had been so many hopes about mm. that, that, you know, it would be another brick in the wall in the case against him for Matty. But look, you know what? Maybe the, the German police will... As soon as he gets out, in whenever it is next year, the, the German police may be waiting for him to say, right, we're going to arrest you for this and throw everything that they have on him. Maybe, hopefully. It'll be sensational. Well, look, let's, let's see where that goes. We leave it there. Yes. That was a good one. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening to us. We'll be back to you next week. Thanks very much, everybody.